Good morning and happy Friday. Here we are and here we go. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing. And in Shanghai, welcome to Bloomberg Markets. China Open, I'm David Inglis. Let's get to your top stories today. Stocks across the Asia Pacific on the up. All eyes on the AK225 as we near an all time high. Traders looking ahead to fresh US inflation figures. And these comments out of Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bossi cautioning on future rate cuts. Now, early data showing a boost in Chinese consumer spending during the Lunar New Year holiday. But a central bank is set to keep policy steady until the economy stabilizes. And the Hang Seng Index expected to add more EV and foreign companies in its upcoming quarterly review. Welcome to the show. Hope you're all well. We've made it. End of the week. Lots to talk about still. As we head into the weekends, uh, just keep in mind, mainland markets are still shut. We begin on Monday. We get a preview of that in just a moment. This risk rally, though, keeps giving, uh, doesn't it? S&P 500 clocked in, I believe, an 11th straight record close uh, in 2024 alone. That's been enough, really, and the Nikkei story in a moment, been enough to push Asia-Pacific stocks here. I think we're now up a fourth straight week, and we're nearing these 2022-month highs, as you can see on your screens. A50 futures coming online in Singapore. S&P futures pulling back uh, a little bit as we speak. Uh, the Nikkei levels to watch, 38,957. That's an intraday high back in 89. 38,915. That was the close on December 29, 1989. As you can see, within about, uh, about 100 points, give or take, there from those levels there. TIEX continues that record run. All-time highs closed yesterday. TSMC. Massive move up yesterday, marginal, if not flat at the open. Singapore budget, that's today, a preview of that later on. Uh, flip the boards, please. Bond markets, we're down a second week on global treasuries. Uh, yields are, have been pushing high. The entire curve is still above 4.2. As far as the treasury goes, some comments coming through out of Mr. Bostic talking about, they actually, this is interesting, more evidence that inflation is headed towards 2% and that they are in no rush to cut interest rates. FX markets, <clears throat> and perhaps why? And the pushback so far mostly this year from Fed officials on those cuts. Dollar is on seven weeks of gains and commodity markets looking like this. Oil trading at three-month highs, or three, near three-month highs at least, or three-week highs. Three-month highs, thank you so much. And <clears throat> we're also looking at crypto-related currencies and stocks, as you can see on your screens. Bitcoin at about 52,000. Massive move up, by the way, in that group of equities yesterday. But, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, our top story, Nikkei 225, closing in. Do we get there today? And what does that actually mean? 38, 900, roughly speaking. Last time we hit these levels, the S&P 500 was, get this, at 350 points. We're at 5,000 now. What 34 years does, doesn't it? Gareth Nicholson is with us, CIO, Head of Discretionary Portfolio Management at Nomura. Gareth, good morning. You guys at Nomura must be looking at this very, very closely. Just your general thoughts on how we got here, where we go on the Nikkei. Well, David, it's a fantastic time to be looking at Japan. Like you said, uh, Nikkei has done uh, fantastic. Uh, it has been a, a sleeping giant for a while, and it's definitely wide awake. Um, we, we see 40,000 on the cards. Um, it's getting there quicker than we expected, um, which is not a bad thing. Um, but the tailwind still remain very, very strong. This is an economy uh, and a, a market that's had structural changes over the last few years that are really kicking in now when a lot of investors are looking to diversify out of China, looking to diversify so I had a U.S. exceptionalism. It's, it's really incredible what we've seen there over the last few years. And Japan is a space that is offering interesting, uh, an interesting place to, to continue to invest. That's an interesting juxtaposition, U.S. exceptionalism, which has driven up the dollar. And uh, I want to ask you about what part of this rally in Japan is because of the weak yen. You know, with a yen at 150, would we even be having this conversation on the Nikkei? Well, I think you would still because uh, it's not just about the exports mm. and the, the cheap yen that's uh, you know growing these companies. It's about the idea that we have a lot more workers in the workforce, be that elderly or, or, or ladies. There's been a structural change over the last few years. It's wages. We've had 3% increase just about last year, and we expect about the same or more. So there's a lot more money in the system. We've also got inflation that's sticky in Japan, which has eaten into a lot of cash balances that have been sitting there doing nothing for many years. You've got $6, 7000000000000 US dollars 
dollars of local money that's now getting incentivized to invest in the stock market. And as we know, we've seen in places like India, when the local money is buying the local equity market, India buying India, and now Japan buying Japan, that makes it very enticing for foreigners to move big amounts of money because they see that stickiness. Uh, and, and that is really just starting to play out. Many investors in the world still have a very low allocation to Japan, given it's, you know, a G3. Um, so there, there is still a, a lot of factors besides the yen that are supporting uh, Japan. Right. And, and this recession or technical recession that we went into last year, is that, in your view, that's a rounding error. Like that, that doesn't matter almost when you look at this equity market. I think so. I mean, there's three teams that we're really looking at. Mm. It's the idea that companies can still increase prices and earnings should be solid, given that inflation's come off a, a little bit from the highs and most economies are still doing pretty well in this environment. As I said, the structural changes make uh, um, the the economy uh, also excited in the market in particular. We expect a lot of buybacks to come through. Um, and then also, you know, politics in the U.S., U.S. exceptionalism, uh, conflicts between U.S. and China uh, still remains uncertain. Um, with regards to, you know, trade, uh, Japan is a great hedge uh, for developed market risk. Uh, uh, and for us, that's just a more and more tailwind. Uh, let's broaden the conversation, let's Gareth. Uh, S&P has done very well. We have a couple of markets in the Asia Pacific outside of Japan that have been doing well. I think Taiwan's at a record high. Indonesia's very close. Europe's at multi-year highs. In other words, this risk rally has been, it's been great for risk assets this year. Is there any reason to doubt this rally or are we really in a good place at this point, generally speaking? Well, I, I think... Uh... I think market is, uh, some market participants have underappreciated the amount of money that's still left in the system. Uh, and even though the Fed has looked to uh, tighten and central banks have done the same, there is just so much liquidity, so much extra cash uh, that wants to, to be deployed. Uh, and that has really helped drive it up. What we are seeing at the moment is a, a real shift between what the Fed has been saying and what the market has been pricing. Uh, and now that is starting to converge. We were at seven, uh, seven hikes, 140 basis points from the market earlier in the year. Now that's down to three, four. Um, and we think that this convergence is going to see some repricing of uh, some, some markets which are priced to perfection. Uh, so there's going to be increased volatility. This is an opportunity to rotate out of price to perfection and go into uh, where there's still value. Um, this is about actively managing that risk. We're still constructive on, on equity, but we don't think it's, it's an environment where you buy everything. We've got to be much more aligned with what sector is going to uh, really perform in this environment, which region is going to perform, and look to diversify those, those books which have really built up a large amount of concentration. Don't get me wrong, it's been a great trade to have a few names in their accounts, but as the market is going to uh, uh, reprice and, and expect more movement from the, from the Fed, um, we want to diversify that risk. Right, and I was going to ask you, this, there's still a mountain of cash that's been that's been parked and sitting in money market funds. I think where last figure was near, or if if not at six trillion. And for the money that's sat this one out this year so far, that's missed the rally. The advice would be what, Gareth? Well, look, six trillion dollars still earning five percent. That's not the the worst outcome. You go back five years, that would have been a great outcome. Uh, when you compare it to equity, yes, it feels like you you've definitely missed out. Um, but the idea of being paid to wait has been quite strong, and that's why we have so much money in that space. Um, we believe now that uh, you know cash is, is not as much of a king. We start seeing that the volatility, at least in the rate space, is starting to justify the idea of buying more duration. Uh, we are already seeing uh, investors starting to uh, rotate out their deposits as those numbers are going down and saying, okay, how am I going to look for income for a longer term? And it's not just about the next three months, the T-bill, uh, maybe six months deposit. It's about locking in these rates for the next 12 months because I do expect volatility and I want that pool of income to be mm. stable for a longer period. So a lot of investors are coming to us for ideas of how to, to, to kind of ensure that they have that income uh, when They've spent the last while being patient and being paid to be patient. Um, so some interesting income plays are now coming into uh, into the mind for investors. Uh, and this is where we're looking to almost uh, barbell. You have that income play coming through, the stability, and you have some of those preferred risk spaces uh, um, that uh, are going to give you that upside if this economy continues. Uh, ask you about China. There have been flows starting to come in. There is uh, certainly very strong data that suggests that there was some money to come in to support this market from uh, maybe official sources, quote unquote. Uh, how do you think this market reopens on Monday when mainland, mainland China comes back online? And what is the let's increment? What is the 
What's the four-week view? Let's look at it in very, very short increments here. Well, to be honest, that's how we're looking at China at the moment. Uh, we've been calling for, uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, to start positioning for a tactical long China. Uh, valuation, obviously, compelling. Uh, the sentiment hasn't been there, and the government and the central bank have been looking to try to shift that sentiment uh, um, as much as they can. We think coming out of the holidays will be really interesting to see how the data portrays, um, because, as you highlighted, we've got flow coming in. So a bit of sentiment is, is shifting. Valuation, obviously, very compelling. Now, if we can get a little bit of the fundamentals, be that the, this holiday break has really been constructive and a lot more trouble and money spent, then we do expect to see a, a, a swift uh, bounce up. Um, for us, this would be a tactical play, which means you want to take opportunity of the swift bounce back and then create the space again to look for the next one. Uh, this is not a long-term trade at the moment. Uh, we, we think there's still quite a lot of uncertainty in the economy, and we'd rather see that clear itself out before we invest, close our eyes, and move on. And Japan, on the other side, is a place we're quite happy to invest, close our eyes for a while, and move on. China, we want to be extremely tactical. If you could be more specific on you know, how tactical you want to be in China, so I'm guessing that's not an index, that's not an index play. So what does that look like to you? What's that trade? Well, we want to find sectors uh, uh, that are really going to be you know, supported by the government, that uh, uh, China, again, the idea of locals buying the local exchange to keep it safe. So we do think that around security is going to be key. So that's uh, energy security, digital security, uh, access to technology. These are spaces that the government wants to maintain control, uh, or at least uh, thought leadership uh, and, uh, um, you know, strength. They will I you know realistically start pushing their support there first. So these are some of the sectors that we would uh, we would really focus on. Um, and as you said, it's not the broad index. It's going down to the sector and then going out to the specific company uh, um, in China, looking for that uh, 10, 15 percent, um, and then reevaluating and looking for the next opportunity. Uh, this is that if you imagine your 80, 20 portfolio, uh, the the 20 percent that is really looking to be super active, we would see a portion of that going into China today. Gareth, hope you had a great week. Have a great week and hi to your team for us as well. Thanks, Gareth Nicholson, the CIO, head of discretionary portfolio management at Numora. And we were just talking about the Fed there and certainly some conversations around how this gap is closed between expectations and in the market and the Fed. And earlier on, we did hear from Rafael Bostic pushing back against that notion of early rate cuts. Have a look. A durable labor market rally alongside muscular economic growth and resurgent business optimism would argue for continued patience in unwinding monetary policy restriction. But you may ask, what of declining inflation? Well, on the surface, rapid deceleration would appear to offer a counterargument to leaving restriction in place much longer. As I noted, headline numbers on a 12-month, 6-month, and 3-month basis are at or near the committee's 2% objective. U.S. two-year yield, 4.6%. Futures are pointing slightly higher ahead of the open. It's sunny. It's a cool and crisp and fantastic 21-degree day here in Hong Kong. Opening bell 16 minutes away. This is Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Happy Friday. Right, welcome back to show. So China's central bank is poised uh, to keep cash conditions, monetary policy broadly stable as policymakers focus on this weakening currency, lots of facets to the conversation. There's also this, I guess, data that suggests this. there's a pickup in activity, spending, travel, coming out of this Lunar New Year holiday. Let's bring in our team here, Jill Desis and Tanya Chen, to talk us through this. You know, Jill, I'll start with you. And we talked about the data that's come through so far on, on spending. It's, it's been encouraging. Yes, it's been, um, I think, some early signs of uh, some positivity in there. So uh, broadly for the Lunar New Year holiday so far, we've seen a pickup in travel over the last year. So uh, you're looking at more train trips around the country, uh, some pickup in flight trips. Uh, you're seeing a little bit of a pickup in, um, you know, other, other road trips. So people are traveling more. I will say that that does compare against 2023 when, yes, uh, COVID curbs were removed, but there was a big uh, uptick in cases last year. So I do think that that complicates the 
data a little bit, but that travel data for 2024 so far is pretty encouraging. And then we've also had some stuff on the spending side. There was a Meituan report uh, that, um, so the delivery platform that state media was just citing yesterday saying that they saw a big pickup in deliveries there, more consumer spending. I do think that some of that picture is a little bit mixed. Um, some early box office receipt data out of China has been just kind of on pace with last year, not necessarily a giant pickup. So maybe people are actually spending less per trip. That's a phenomenon I will remind you that we saw during a golden week at the end of last year. Uh, but yeah, so I think overall um, some signs of encouragement there, but I do have to caution you, David, like, look, I mean, this is still an economy that's dealing with a lot of deflationary pressures and some of those risks. So I would say, you know, cautious optimism for now. Yeah, and that takes us to the economy conversation. Before I bring Tanya in, just so we have two things coming up. We have the MLF and the loan prime rates coming up. Give us a sense of how the PBOC is looking at this. Yeah, so I think at this point for the PBOC, um, I, we are expecting a decision on that medium-term lending facility rate um, at the beginning of next week. Now, at this point, are they actually going to make a cut? Remember, uh, last month is when a lot of economists actually thought they'd follow through with something. We didn't actually uh, see a cut to that lending rate last month. Um, as a result, the LPRs were stable. Usually those things track each other, although I will say not always. Uh, I think this time around, um, you know, a lot of economists are thinking that they're going to hold steady on this rate once we get into the beginning of next week. Uh, a couple of different factors at play. One, we're just coming off of this big Lunar New Year holiday. I'm not sure we're going to see immediate action right there. Two, uh, the PBOC did just cut uh, the reserve requirement ratio for major banks to sort of free up some mm. liquidity just a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it might be too early for an MLF cut. Maybe we'll get something in March. I will. And then the third factor I want you to keep in mind here is that we are gearing up for two sessions, the big national legislative session at the beginning of March. That's really where we're seeing a big policy agenda set for the beginning of 2024, you might want to wait until after we get clear of that legislative session before we actually see some big moves from the PBOC again. Right. And, and Tanya, I'll bring you in on that. So in the meantime, so they want to keep things stable, but you know, proactive policy means a weaker currency. Correct. Um, and you kind of have to think about where the currency is going into this operation, right? Yeah. So they've been defending the 7.2 line since November. Um, also, over the past week, we got this U.S. CPI dollar is much stronger now. Yeah. This offshore yuan, I think, uh, fell back to a three-month low this week. So going into next week, uh, the onshore yuan is definitely going to be on the back foot. It's going to be under pressure. Um, it's going to kind of be retracing some of the moves from the CPI, but also heading into um, the next month, we have also some negative seasonality that goes with the currency. So bearing all of this in mind with what Jill was saying, I mean, the policymakers have to juggle all these things, right? They have to do, juggle this impossible trinity that we've covered so often, this capital outflows, um, monetary policy, and the currency. Um, so again, this is one of the reasons why economists are saying they're not going to make a move on the MLF rate and also not likely to inject too much cash into the system um, this time. And as far as fixings go, Monday will be the first time in a couple, well, at least a week and a half, we get the reference rate for the day? Yeah, I mean, um, the PBOC has said um, the first working day could potentially be on Sunday, so we're really on watch for anything that may happen with the currency markets. Um, I think looking at the rest of the currency realm, we've got the yen, which is already starting to get back to those intervention levels. Yep. Um, we've heard currency strategists say, you know, the, the PBOC really looks at how um, the yuan compares to its regional trading partners, especially the Korean won, the Japanese yen. If the yen continues to weaken, there might be possibility that they might let go and kind of let the currency weaken a little bit more, but we'll have to see. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Jill, you mentioned the NPC, and you mentioned let's, let's talk after that, and certainly hopes are high. <laughs> would, would, that, would that be accurate that they might do something, announce something there? Yeah, well, I think that with, uh, at this point with the NPC, the big thing to watch is going to be whatever they set the economic growth target for the year at. So I totally believe this is an economic target that's probably set at their big work conference in December, but then isn't announced until March. Last year, they set it at around 5%. Uh, that was deemed kind of conservative at the time, although they did manage to hit it just slightly uh, past uh, 5% 5, 5 for 2023. I think at this point, a lot of analysts are expecting them to set a very, fairly similar target for 2024. So around around 5% again. That would be a bit more ambitious than last year because the base of comparison uh, was a bit more favorable considering growth was so weak in 2022. We'll see what ultimately happens, but that is going to be a really, really closely watched target because whatever policymakers decide in terms of what that growth target looks like, that gives us an idea for how much stimulus they might introduce this year, what their expectations are for activity and growth, and then you know how that might actually carry through to policy action through the rest of 2024. Fantastic team. Jill, thank you so much. Jill Desis and Tanya 
Shenzhen. They're in all things China. So in about nine minutes, we get the open as well. We'll leave you with a look at how this Chinese renminbi has traded offshore while the onshore was asleep. That's about a third of 1% weaker. So we might please see some catch down. We'll see, of course, if Sunday is the first working day back, then I guess some of these guys will be at work on Sunday. Not me, though. I'll be on a plane to somewhere nice. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Here are some major stories that we're following from around the world. Taiwan is defending the action by its Coast Guard after a, well, an operation led to the death of two Chinese fishermen. A China-registered speedboat carrying four people capsized that's off the coast of Jinmen Island. That's on Wednesday. That's after refusing inspection by authorities. The rest of those on board were rescued. Now China has condemned Taiwan for this specific incident. Now, uh, the White House, and the White House rather, says that Russia is developing anti-satellite capability, but that it's not yet active and poses no current threats. The statement comes after House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner warned of a un unspecified national security concern. Now, Bloomberg has learned, has also learned that the U.S. intelligence uh, shows Russia is discussing the possibility of a nuclear weapon in space. Right, uh, back to the here, back on Earth, back to the here and now, I guess. Uh, when you look at these markets, so we're about five minutes to the opening bell. It's the last one where uh, we don't have the stock connect because things reopen on mainland on Monday. So uh, volumes are, I guess, almost certainly going to be well below their average uh, if everything was open. That being said, price does indicate a higher open today, 16,000 on the Hang Seng Index. So a couple of things on the agenda today. So you have a quarterly review, which we have a, a very nice preview of what could happen on the index. So that comes out about an hour or so after the market closes on Friday or later today. And certainly what names might be included, what do the number of constituents go up, what the representation is going to be. A lot of this is obviously based on uh, certainly incentive and, and, and past trends and past comments, but we really have to wait and see until they do come up with that. Now, in terms of, we talked about this already, right? So some of the data that's also come through, and hence we're looking at Meituan, for example, it's going to come up bottom of your screens very soon. Uh, some of the holiday spending has been quite flattering. 155 percent compared to 2019. So watch that. And of course, as far as earnings go, we talked MGM China Sands. China comes out with earnings later today. Meituan 1.6 percent to the upside. Some of your chip stock and some of the tourism related names in focus as you can see on your screens. The open, a couple of minutes away. Keep it here. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Welcome back to shows. Markets are likely going to see a higher open here in Hong Kong. Final one of the week, final one before mainland China reopens and joins the fray Monday next week. Price action this week on proxies to suggest a higher open on Monday. Maybe a stronger anchoring out of the PBOC as far as the currency is concerned, given the dollar strength that's come through. So dollar, as far as that's concerned, seven weeks now of, of dollar strength going into this one, which is quite interesting because that's taken place against the backdrop of a risk rally, which those two things normally don't coexist. And pushback coming through earlier on uh, from Rafael Bostic talking about how they're not in no rush to uh, cut interest rates. And it seems that markets have coalesced with Fed expectations and it, as far as the soft landing scenario goes, as far as the economy is concerned, certainly no soft landing as far as markets go. So it's been an almost Goldilocks moment for equity markets. As you can see, 16,000 Hang Seng Index, HS Tech, 7 tenths of 1%. We could see a third day of gains as long as these gains do last. Uh, keep in mind, we opened lower Wednesday and Thursday, but we closed higher in both days, which I guess bodes well, I guess, for momentum. Several pockets of this market were tracking closely. Uh, consumption, first and foremost, given the encouraging data that's come through so far, 
and commentary from analysts like City talking about Macau. You have securities news in Shanghai talking about Meituan data. And as you can see, uh, consumption names are leading uh, some of the gains today. We're also looking at May 2, not to be confused with May 1, on the back also of uh, this move in crypto. Uh, Bitcoin, for example, 51, 52K, and that's really uh, part and parcel of the, I guess, the crypto story as well. Uh, a couple of markets coming online. Uh, one more, at least here in the Asia Pacific, it's the Philippines. And just to round things up, as you can see, broad risk rally. Uh, Singapore budgets today, Taiwan record high. Nikkei almost at all time highs. That's about 200 points. 300 points near. And of course, Jakarta, which comes online next hour, top the next hour, that's also within about 1% of all time highs. Right, let's focus in though, what's, hap what's happening here in this Chinese market, what Monday looks like, what the next two weeks looks like, and can we even look beyond that? Joining us here to talk us through these markets is our team, our round table here, Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Marvin Chen, and joining us out of the UK, Shaolin Chen, Head of International at Crane Shares. Guys, pleasure to have you. Good morning and happy Friday. Marvin, let me, uh, let me start with you. You've done some data crunching on this and you've had to look at some of the, the, con some of the Stock Connect flows going into the break and that suggests that there was really intervention perhaps that took place here to stabilize the market. Yeah, so, you know, even though we haven't had any concrete details on the market rescue plan, the flows uh, do suggest that, um, you know, th the funds are mobilizing into early February. We had um, eight consecutive, consecutive days of inflows uh, leading into the uh, New Year holiday. And, uh, you know, these funds have been going into um, ETFs, SOEs, and financials. And to us, this suggests that, um, you know, this, uh, this is um, state buying. Um, going forward, we want to see that, uh, you know, these flow funds kind of broaden out to the small and mid-cap stocks, which have kind of lagged the recent rebound. Um, but, you know, these measures, again, are um, uh, Band-Aid for the market, and it's still too early to say if uh, foreign investors are really buying in. Right. And, and any evidence that things have worked or the fact that the market has not fallen is evidence enough? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rebound is, uh, it, we, we've seen the rebound uh, before the holidays, and we think that the, the floor is in, but obviously there's expectations for uh, uh, more support. Um, you know, PBOC has a chance to kind of uh, extend this momentum with the rate cut next week. Uh, Bloomberg Economics uh, is estimating a 10 basis points rate cut. Um, but, you know, market reaction to mon uh, monetary easing at this point has been quite limited. And we think uh, China will have to lean more heavily on uh, fiscal measures. And so, you know, the, the budget um, fiscal deficit numbers will be uh, announced in, uh, in early March at the policy meeting. Yeah, the two meetings. Yeah. So, uh, necessary but not sufficient, I guess. Shaolin, let me, let me bring you in. Marvin said the floor was in. Do you think the floor is in? The national team, good morning, Davis. Thank you for having me again on your program. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when the national team um, says they will come in to provide the uh, stabilizing fund for the capital markets and they, they keep their words, uh, they really started to buy. Like uh, Marvin was saying, we see some flows into Asia. Uh, clearly, this is signal to investors. This is the floor. This is the put. Uh, they feel more comfortable uh, to start buying. And obviously, some of the corporates also started to buying the shares back very heavily. Uh, you know, uh, Alibaba made an announcement in the last quarter earning, also saying they're going to buy their shares back. Um, so you see corporate action, you see national team's option, uh, action, excuse me. Uh, these will give us, or at least the investors, the confidence that they are seeing this level at very attractive valuation. On top of that, you see very sufficient liquidity uh, in the system. Uh, I, I'm very glad to see the January credit data start to pick up really healthy signs. Uh, means corporate and households start to picking up on the credit side. Uh, it's a step forward, or it's also a step leading uh, indicator to tell the market that flow started to circulate in the systems. So with corporate thinking their valuation is really an attractive value, with the liquidity is sufficient, with corporate started taking up the liquidities, uh, we stay very optimistic from this level. Okay, and so the opens next week, what do you think the window looks like, Shaolin, between the open, the reopen, and the NPC? Can we assume that markets will remain stable? Can we assume that put is in? Optics would not be good if we had a market that's crashing going into the NPC. The, obviously, the policymaker has made everything possible, or they could possibly do, mm -hmm. to reassure the market they are caring about investors' concern with providing liquidity, physical budgeting expansion, 
last year they announced one trillion bond issuance. That bond issuance is completed. Uh, the, the, the liquidity is available in the system for, for the investors to come and take it. Um, that's all in, you know, in the system today. And they also change a new uh, you know, leadership at CSRC. Now they're reassuring the market they have liquidity to stabilize in the market. And the other uh, you know, side of the uh, correction happened in January was really the structure notes get hit at the technical level for them to sell. Those are cleared up pro probably about 80 to 90 percent is done. Um, I do think they would uh, come back with some strong data, I sincerely hope, to give some indications on the travel, uh, on the consumption side during holiday season, and hopefully federal data reconfirm the trends that are, uh, you know, the 9 billion trips uh, that is suspected by some of the medias happen during this festival period of time is indeed a reality. When that happens, we, we want to see consumer numbers. All of that gives you some of the leeways, leads up to uh, March, the NPC. We have built up, and investors have built up five hope on NPC for concrete measures, concrete policies. I do hope that policymakers will deliver uh, once more on the concrete plans of where they're going to deploy all these liquidities and help the corporate to guide where they're going to spend, where they're going to participate from the economic pickup. Okay, well, let's pick up on the consumption theme in just a moment and you know, some of the data we've seen so far. You know, Marvin, I'll bring you back in here. Any reaction so far to what uh, Shaolin had to say? And I guess the, the broader question there is also we've seen buybacks, we've seen a change at the CSRC, mm -hmm. for example. Have you seen, in your opinion, a strong enough message from authorities there that the floor is, in fact, in here and that they do want to support the market? Yeah, I think uh, you know they've they've done uh, uh, quite a wide, broad range of uh, support measures, and you know the changes C C at the head of CSRC is is an important signal. I think uh, that you know we are going to see uh, changes in the market structure. Um, but you, I agree, you're you're right. The optics are very important leading up to the MPC meeting, and you know it's all about sentiment right now. Um, even though the fundamentals look good, we we're having a problem of confidence in in the outlook. So I think uh, you know. The sentiment is a key, key factor here. Shaolin, back to you. Good point for Marvin. The fundamentals have yet to really move on this market. We've seen the early data suggest that that might be on the way. Do you think mm -hmm. we can get a rally? Because it, it will take many months for investors to be convinced or even early convinced here that you know, the economy has in fact bottomed. It's easy to damage and then hard to rebuild them back. But I think the policy guys show their sincere commitments to rebuild their co investors' confidence globally since March last year. So they have been doing that for nearly uh, 11, 12 months by now uh, to show them, uh, you know, the investors by doing the uh, monetary easing, uh, to do the uh, injection in terms of liquidity, uh, and to pronounce or announce a lot of the pro-growth policies, which we want more reconfirmation. That's why you see, uh, David, a lot of the time investors are saying, we want reconfirmation. They, they, they heard what the policymakers are trying to do, but they want reconfirmation to give them more confidence and more confidence. I think, indeed, they have filled the stabilizing, the put policy being put in place. And at this level, David, you, you've been following the market long enough. You know, with this kind of attractive valuation, with corporate is starting to take credits uh, to borrow, to expand, to spend on CapEx, and nearly a quarter of the MSCI China index trading below their book value, with the sufficient liquidity in the systems and with the uh, pro of policy announced with the physical budgeting, uh, you know, plans to expand, with all of that in one bucket to support the growth to rebound. You couldn't always get this moment like this, that everything you check is actually on the pro growth, pro corporate, pro pickup side. Uh, it's a very rare moment. And at the same time, investors globally, mutual funds, hedge funds, all included globally, are under with China. Their position to allocating to China is that historical low. Uh, all, all these Chinese stocks, even growth stocks, are at their 10 years history, one standard deviation below their 10 years average. So I think this is really a right. level that shows this is a contrary trade. Well, it, it's worth pointing out those conditions existed anyway last year. So my question, follow up to you then, Sheldon, is w mm -hmm. with the U.S. market that can't stop rallying, you look at the Nikkei 225, you look at other equity markets, look at Europe, for example, why, why is China a good alternative then? If, if, the, if the alternatives do, 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 do seem to suggest past performance uh, and haven't burned markets this badly. 
uh, you know, this is the market when everything in place to properly rebound, it can rebound very sharp, very quickly. Investors can miss out on the ready. Uh, I do agree a lot of the intention was in place in China's capital market mm. in 2023, but they were not as big mm. as the uh, monetary support trillions of dollars announced since, you know, just last quarter. Uh, trillions of trillions announced mm. by the Chinese policy. I mean, it was not in place in 2023. This is one. And also this could be a surprise treat on the upside. You have witnessed in October when CCP concluded a year and a half ago that how quickly market can rebound. It's really hugely underallocated. It's not a crowded trade. If the investor truly looking for a diversified portfolio, a global truly diversified portfolio, uh, China is the second largest economy in the world. Students represent only 2% in MSCI or country uh, index. Yeah, and certainly Michael Burry the biggest holdings now, mm -hmm. Chinese tech. We were just talking with Nomura earlier on, and, and their advice is long tactical China this next four weeks or so. Marvin, final thoughts here, and as we go into next week, do you think mainland markets open higher or lower? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we can open with some positive momentum if uh, as the markets return refreshed, uh, you know, in the year of the dragon. You know, we, we have some catch up gains with the Hong Kong markets this week. Um, as you mentioned, the focus may be on the consumer sectors as investors kind of digest the holiday spending and data. Um, you know, and we think this will broadly reflect that, you know, Chinese consumers are still expecting, uh, still wanting these festive experiences, although they may be a little bit more budget budget conscious. At least they're still spending, right? Marvin, fantastic stuff. Marvin Chen, Bloomberg Intelligence, Equity Strategy, of course. And uh, Shaolin Chen, thank you so much for joining us, too, head of international at Crane Shares. A brief look at markets, Cosby, Taiwan, ASX, and all eyes on this other one, the Nikkei 225, off highs of the day. We're still within striking distance of all time highs. Plenty more ahead. Happy Friday. This is Bloomberg. All right, the index, Hang Seng, that is, just coming off highs right now. We were past tense above 16,000, so we're trading sideways to flat. Uh, there's a major risk event or opportunity, we could look at it both ways, obviously, uh, coming up later today after the close. So the quarterly review, that's coming up, and uh, what could be in story of the Hang Seng Index, of course, maybe adding more of these EV names more foreign flavor. Uh, the exchange is aiming to also expand the index to 100 members from the current 82. Let's bring in Sangmi Chao, our stocks reporter, to talk us through what the possibilities are and what names might be included after this review. Foreign flavor indeed. So mm. I've been hearing a lot about uh, Prada or uh, companies like Samsonite that could be mm. added to the index. Um, that would mean that the uh, index is um, telling story. They're sending a message and saying uh, the foreign companies can consider listing in Hong Kong, although uh, they're struggling with the uh, sluggish market right now. And uh, I've been hearing about Xpeng a lot. So the EV maker, mm. which uh, when considering Li Auto was recently added to the index as well. And it's been the best performing stock in 2023 uh, in uh, among the HSI um, Xpong is uh, the name that, that the analysts are talking a lot so but when looking at the index the Hang Seng index saw uh, slid uh, more than six percent um, from the start of this year yep. so the whole point is uh, to boost this uh, benchmark which has been falling the past uh, four years and any reason why I think so, so four names that's that's an interesting angle how about healthcare? That's, that's also in the conversation. That's right. Uh, we have been hearing uh, about Beijing a lot. It's a global mm. biotech company that's yep. doing well in the U.S., uh, known for oncology drugs. And we, I have also heard about Innovent Bio, which is uh, leading the obesity drugs trials in China. And uh, these are the names that are popping up because um, Beijing especially is the mega cap um, in, among the Hang Seng uh, healthcare index alone. It's the top uh, mega, uh, the market cap yep. when it comes to that index so they could be added and especially because healthcare is the only sector that's underrepresented in uh, the Hang Seng index because um, the whole point is to uh, boost their mar market cap to 50 percent so that's the only one that's not doing doing that and so uh, the tech sector however is uh, very heavy so uh, there could be no additions coming from the tech stocks uh, but um, and also there might be no deletions this time around since uh, they want to have the constituents up to 
to 100. Yeah, so we're currently at what, what number? 80? 82. Okay, and yeah. the, the expectation is we get uh, we, we get 18 more stocks added to the index. Talk that's more, true. Talk more that's about true. that. Yeah. And that's very unlikely this year, but then it's a very gradual process that mm. they started on from a very small number, like 33. Yeah, interesting. I'm looking at the chart here. So 33 back in 06, we went to 50, 2014 to 2021, and we grew quite a bit, almost like this market hit puberty. I'm kidding. Sangmi, thank you so much. Sangmi Cha there, our Asia stocks reporter. Ignore me. It's Friday. Okay, uh, plenty more heads. Uh, we're looking at markets right now. Hang Seng Index, a third of 1%. MSCI China is now flat. I can't stop thinking about the Nikkei, though. That's still in my mind. This is Bloomberg. There you go. Good day to be long these equity markets. It's been a good four weeks, in fact, here. Uh, Nikkei 38.5, uh, Taiwan is all-time highs. And, in fact, one market that opens up in the next hour, which is Jakarta, is, I think, within 1% of also hitting levels not seen in, in forever. Okay, let's look at Korea. Kospi, as you can see on your screen. So Seoul is actually set. Uh, this, this comes in late March, set to host one of the most hotly anticipated Major League Baseball season openers. That's next month. I spoke with the city's mayor, Oh Se Hoon, on how he's looking to make these games, these MLB games, regular features in South Korea. Have a look. Yeah, 그렇습니다. Uh, 제가 기억하기로는... MLB expressed its intention to visit regularly in the future if this event goes well. About a month ago, I met with Charlie Hill, vice president of global business development at Major League Baseball, and decided in principle to proceed that way. Well, how are the preparations leading up to the two games in March? Is everything in place? What else needs to be prepared and put in place ahead of the big event? As you know, Seoul has the only dome stadium in Korea. It's a small to medium-sized dome stadium that seats about 20,000 people, but it's a very popular venue. It was built about 10 years ago and needs some repairs. In order to maintain a ground condition that meets international standards and allows players to demonstrate their skills to the fullest, we are currently spending a considerable amount of money on renovations, including installing floodlights and replacing the ground grass. That's, that, that's good to know. And I'm wondering, just below 20,000 in capacity, that doesn't sound like a big stadium. You mentioned it's a medium-sized stadium. Did you ever consider moving that to a larger venue? And in the future, are you considering building an even larger stadium to host these big events? Because less than 20,000, that's not really a big, that's not really a big place. <laughs> of course. The sports mice complex in Chamsil, the sports facility that hosted the 1988 Seoul Olympics, is undergoing extensive renovation. There are plans to build a new dome stadium that can accommodate about 30,000 people. When I went to Canada, I saw the home stadium of the Toronto Blue Jays, and there's a hotel attached to the outfield, so you can watch professional baseball in the hotel's indoor facilities. We're in the process of planning this as a benchmark. And have you, have you worked out how much the project will cost? It's in progress as a private investment project. A development company formed a consortium and is currently negotiating with the Seoul Metropolitan Government. And the negotiations with a full framework will probably be conducted within this year and construction will begin as soon as possible. And I, I then need to ask about crowd control and crowd safety because of, of course, the tragic events in Itaewon. What is the city government doing to ensure that the crowds will be safe? Actually, the Itaewon incident was a safety accident that occurred at an unexpected time and in an unexpected place. Gochok Dome is a representative venue for K-pop concerts, with dozens of large-scale games held there. This is a place that has proven dozens of times to attract crowds who can quickly leave after watching. There you go, the mayor of Seoul, Oh Se Hoon, uh, with, with, with me, um, in, clearly in Seoul. <laughs> there we go. Um, if there wasn't enough branding in the shot. Just need to mention it. Okay, uh, more on these markets right now. Logan, 
Uh, stock is trading like this. Uh, yeah, there's a winding up hearing in about 40 minutes from now, so do expect some news coming through, and we'll get those news to you, of course, once we do have them uh, on your screens right now. So, I mean, we'll see uh, what, what the fate, at least for this specific builder, looks like, um, and certainly liquidation risk is certainly on the table, as you can see there. So want to watch going into the next hour. Uh, just to recap, some of the lines coming through out of uh, the Atlanta Fed, about two hours back, in fact, so talking about how they actually might need new information on, on inflation. There's no urgency to cut. Uh, we all know about the strong labor market, the economy, although what's interesting is the juxtaposition. When you look beneath the hood, certainly there are more data points that suggest weakness in the labor market and cracks there. I mean, don't, don't get me started in commercial real estate. But anyway, uh, pushback coming through, and as we were pointing out earlier on as well, Markets have, as you can look at this, coalesced their expectations around the Fed's latest dot plot, which is three cuts. Half of 1% to the upside in MCI Asia Pacific, and in case you missed it, uh, S&P 500 clocking in. All-time high, record close, number 11 so far in 2024. Most sectors are higher. The Jakarta Open is next. This is Bloomberg.